So from our last video, um, I showed uh, the machining of those bars there, which ended up being a much better way to go about things rather than machining individual cubes. Uh, I wish I had more bars like that or more material to which uh, from which to cut bars of that size, but I just don't. I was kind of limited in scope. But after I cut them and uh, faced them to the appropriate dimensions of 16 millimeter, I uh, put them on the bandsaw and thought, well, heck, I'll just try to cut them all, all four bars at the same time. That ought to save some time. And uh, that worked out pretty well, uh, although the, the clamping mechanism of the Harbor Freight bandsaw pretty much sucks. And it will only clamp at the very bottom. And the tighter you clamp, the further, the looser the clamp gets at the top. So I had to put a C clamp up there, and I had to sort of uh, match the uh, the clamping pressure between the bottom and the top in order to grip them off. But uh, with some tweaking, it ended up working out pretty well. And I'm just uh, individually taking the cubes off as they cut, just so they don't, uh, you know, fall down and get dinged or something. I'm also trying to keep track of which cues come from which bars so I can keep them together uh, for when I clamp them in the vise in future operations. I know that they're all from the same bar, from the same cuts, so they're exactly the same dimension. I had quite the time uh, with that old bandsaw blade, which uh, the, the blade that came with the saw I never used. I basically just hung it up on a nail somewhere. And I ended up buying a, a bimetal blade right off the bat. And uh, it seemed to work fine, but at some point it just didn't cut um, square from the top of the cut to the bottom of the cut. And I, and I tried to trace it back down to some culprit but just couldn't figure it out so I kind of figured that the blade may have gotten damaged on one side because uh, I do remember a piece getting wedged on the outside of the blade there so maybe that was it I don't know but anyway that saw ended up breaking and I went back and returned it and got another one so that's the one I'm using here and it seems to be working much better it'll cut you know it'll be almost the same from the very top of the cut to the bottom so that's great so, uh, this is uh, at 5x speed. Um, basically, I was just scribing a line at the top and then cutting to the outside of that line. But, um, kind of a better way to do it, I found, is to actually have some sort of spacer. And that ended up being what I did, as you saw earlier. So doing it this way saves a, a tremendous amount of material rather than trying to mill, mill the cubes out and a lot of time. So this ended up cutting uh, straight up and down quite nicely. And when I got them all cut into cubes now. <coughs> Excuse me. And now what I'm doing is taking that band sawed edge or the band sawed side and cutting it to where it's square to the other uh, machine surfaces. <coughs> 
this is just uh, you know your typical squaring of a block procedure here I'm just taking off five thousands <clears throat> I have a little handwritten program that uh, it'll take off five thousands at a time every time I press cycle start so I can vary how much it takes off and I just want to take off enough to where it gives a, a machined uh, surface across the entire face <clears throat> these sides will be machined later with the face mill but it's just so I can have a machined uh, face that is um, exactly perpendicular to the ones <clears throat> that have been machined with the face mill <clears throat> and these I just did individually surprisingly it goes very quickly and what I do is I just set it in the vise there then I'll <clears throat> move the part to where it's pressing up against the end mill and I'll push down and tighten the vise at the same time just make sure it's in there good and then just hit cycle start <clears throat> and it does one pass it comes in five thousandths, does one pass, backs out, and then it waits for me to either stop it or to do another pass.
So, uh, I, because the the lengths of each piece are, are not uniform coming off the bandsaw, uh, I just wanted to take off the bulk of the material with the half an inch roughing end mill. Uh, this one has taken a serious beating machining this titanium. Um, the bottom <coughs> edges are so blunted, it, it sounds like it's just hammering the material away rather than cutting it. But I don't really have another one suitable for this purpose yet. They're kind of expensive. This one's like 50 bucks. <clears throat> but that's okay. It got me through this patch. And that's really all I need. And it still, it still seems to, to work. It's just not optimal. And it's just going to get worse. So this needs to be replaced at some point in the near future. These are just manual operations too. I don't know exactly what the depth is. I just come down to a certain depth, <coughs> leaving enough for the face mill. And then I just kind of buzz over the whole surface of it with, uh, with my keyboard, just jogging it. And uh, of course, trying to keep the end mill in a climb cutting condition <coughs> as much as I can. <coughs> but I'll show a, a better picture of the ends of the cutting flutes at the end of the video so you can see what kind of damage this thing has sustained. I also ended up slowing the spindle a speed down a little bit and the feed rate down a little bit just thinking that might help. <coughs> it did seem to help a little bit. The hammering noise wasn't quite as loud but it was still uh, very prevalent. So this, this cutter definitely needs to be uh, retired. It still gives a pretty decent surface finish. I mean, that is shiny and uniform. There's no ridges or anything like that. It looks kind of funny just because of the way the light reflects off the machine marks, but it's actually very, very flat. And uh, <coughs> that newly machined surface is now ready for the, the face mill. So each, each one of these five are machined out of the same bar. So the vise holds them all equally tight. <clears throat> I've learned that if you try to mix and match uh, individual cubes machined from different bars, the tolerances might be a little bit different <clears throat> and invariably you end up getting one of them that doesn't clamp tightly and when that tool hits it, it pulls it up out of the vise and, cra and crashes your tool. <laughs> 
Ask me how I know. So back again with the face mill, I'm just going over those uh, faces that, that were machined with that roughing end mill and putting a nice finish on them. And I'm bringing the, I'm bringing the uh, cut down to the terminal depth, if you will. So uh, when the face mill is done machining these sides, uh, <clears throat> those cubes will be exactly 16 millimeter. Doing this, I actually had the opportunity to hear uh, one of these carbide inserts go bad in mid-cut. The cut started off fine at the beginning of the bar, and the uh, the spindle load just kept climbing and climbing, and it went from like 11% up to 20 something percent, and the cut just sounded worse and worse and more under strain. So I stopped it at the end of the cut and I inspected it, and, and uh, the cutting edge of the carbide. <clears throat> was uh, seemed quite a bit more dull than I had remembered from previous cuts. So I replaced the cutter and continued, and suddenly everything sounded much better. And there's those uh, carbide inserts and also uh, the roughing end mill just taking a real beating. Most of the chips were from crashes, but uh, without crashing, it still kind of rounds over the cutting edge. And here's what I have left, and these are ready for the finishing operations, which will be in the next video.